Well, thank you very much. Um, and thank you, everybody, for all the wonderful, kind things you've said about CIP. Um, we owe it all to Michael <laughs> and uh, him telling, teaching us what it's like to, um, to be a person with Asperger's syndrome. So you know how his first, um, his first little box, and he talked about shift happening? Well, about halfway through the panel, uh, halfway through the ch uh, panel, Michael sends me a little note saying, don't talk about what you were going to talk about, talk about this. <laughs> so the lovely handout that I made for all of you, scrap it. Uh, <laughs> He's the boss, what can I do? Um, so what I am going to do tonight is, um, because of what the panel said about CIP, other members of the panel, and what is currently kind of going on uh, in the Ontario government about finding ways to support young men and women with ASD at the college and university level, uh, Michael and I thought that we would tell you a little bit about what we do at CIP as a way to kind of educate you to how, how it works and why we do what we do. So the thing about CIP is it's a very comprehensive program. We look at each of our students as a unique individual with different strengths and different um, challenges, and we endeavor to address address those in every area of their life. So we provide a number of different services in order to do that. First, um, academic support. Um, we do provide tutoring for our students if they need it. Now, as you know, most of our students are extremely intelligent young people. Um, so tutoring isn't always necessary. Sometimes they need it more to help them focus, to actually get work done, not because they don't understand the material. <laughs> what we've discovered, one of the most important things that we do at CIP from an academic support perspective is we communicate with professors. Now, this isn't like mom calling the professor and saying, you know, I want this for my son or daughter. We don't ask a lot of the professors. All we want to know is, is the student showing up to class? How are they doing on their tests or assignments or whatever? So that we can help our students solve problems before they get too big. Because as someone noted, in the, at the university level, you might have three assignments all semester, and that's your grade. And if you do poorly on one, it can, it can affect your, your grade for the whole semester. So we'd like to find out early if there's a problem so we can assist the student in solving it. Um, now, we also um, do a lot of work on executive functioning skills. And as I learn and grow in this field, what, what I've determined is that uh, weak executive functioning skills really underlie so many of the problems that these young people have in all areas of life, not just academically, but across the board. That's what I was going to talk about. Um, so we do a lot of work on executive functioning skills. We work on them in their, in their residences where they live. Um, they live in apartments. In, in Amherst, they live in two-bedroom apartments. Uh, so we have two students in each apartment. Uh, so we help them develop um, organizational schemes and routines that assist them in keeping track of all their responsibilities. And there's nothing like uh, college courses to kind of force you to learn better executive functioning skills because you have to have them to do college or university successfully. So we do do a lot of work on executive functioning skills. Another really big part of our program is social thinking. And we don't teach social skills as much as social understanding. We use a lot of the concepts of Michelle Garcia Winner's work. I don't know if you're familiar with her. But we, we work on perspective taking. You know, how does this look, how does this situation look from several different perspectives? Your professor's going to have a different perspective than you do. Other students in your class have a perspective. You have a perspective. But just because it's your perspective doesn't mean it's, it's right. It's a different perspective. And so we do a lot about being able to understand what it looks like from different points of view. 
Uh, we also do a lot about understanding how what you do impacts other people in other situations. So if you walk into a university class and everyone around you is sitting quietly listening to the professor and you're making a lot of noise, that's going to impact that situation. Or you pull out your laptop and you start, you know, reading fan fiction and laughing out loud, that's going to affect everyone in that situation. So you have to begin to understand how you, how you impact other situations, uh, other people in the situations. And then you have to understand how other people impact you. Because so much of what happens to us throughout a day is the result of how we've been affected by the people we interact with. And so, of course, this understanding how the social world works is a key to success. I don't know about here in Canada. I know in the United States they say that uh, EQ, emotional IQ, is more important in s to be successful in the adult world than your intelligence um, quotient. So you have to learn how to deal with the world socially. Um, then, this is a very unique thing that we do at CIP. We, we have a wellness piece to our program. So many of our students struggle with um, anxiety. And they don't realize the role that what they eat, how much exercise they get, how they, um, how they view their world, how they view themselves, contributes to that anxiety that they experience. And so we do a lot of work at getting them out from behind their computers, where a lot of them live, spend a lot of time there, but getting them out from behind their computer and out doing things, just participating in things with other people. And that really is the beginning of learning how to manage anxiety and other intense emotions, things like depression, things like um, social phobias, all of those kinds of things. So we do a lot of um, wellness work with them and trying to get them motivated to do those kinds of things for themselves, to make healthy food choices, to think about what you're buying at a store that you're going to consume, taking the time to cook a meal for yourself rather than running and eating some fast food because your body is nourished by the food you eat and the quality of the food you eat is really important. We do a huge life skills piece. So after they're back from their classes at school and they've done all their appointments with their CIP staff, um, we send staff into their apartments to teach them how to cook, to teach them how to clean and keep their place picked up and looking decent, um, how to do their laundry and have a routine so they don't run out of clean clothes <laughs> before they've done some laundry. Um, just all the, the basics of keeping your life together so that you can live independently. Uh, we do menu planning with them, take them grocery shopping, help them learn how to choose food, um, how to shop frugally so they're not spending too much money on groceries, all of those kinds of things. Another big piece is the recreational piece. We uh, do social activities on the weekends so that they, again, come out from behind their computers, come out from their hiding places, and do things with uh, each other and become part of the community. We do community service projects with them. We um, encourage them to pick things to do on weekends that they would enjoy doing. And um, this year in particular, we have this group of first-year students who have really become friends with one another and uh, do a lot of things together. And I think for some of them, it may be the first time in their lives that they've had what they feel like are real authentic close friendships, and it's really a pleasure to see that happening among them. Um, we provide counseling, um, both uh, cognitive behavioral therapy as well as art therapy um, for those who would prefer that kind of thing. So if they're very artistic, I know at some of our centers they do more of that where they have very artistic students who express their feelings better through art therapy. Um, at each of the centers, we're developing now a creative arts program, but the real leader is our program in Lee, Massachusetts, which is the one Michael founded originally. 
And they have opened an art gallery there that kind of um, exhibits the art of the autism community. And they've had some incredible exhibits there of art that would, um, the few that I've seen, it, it would just, uh, it's incredible art and done by people on the autism spectrum. So I, I really love that he's doing that for the autism community. And they also have started a visual and performing arts program. So a lot of our students love theater and acting, and sometimes they can be better on the stage, uh, come across more socially, at, um, what's the word on this? have a greater social aptitude when they're performing than day to day in life. And so it's a real uh, freedom giving, expressive way to express themselves, and they really, really enjoy that. For students who are not uh, college bound, we do have a program that emphasizes developing work skills and finding opportunities in the community for competitive employment. We call that our C-STEP program. And that is for students who may not be college material or just don't have the interest in going to college or university. Um, and so we prepare them with a, a lot of the same things, social understanding, executive functioning, but do it through the workplace instead of uh, college. Now, one thing I think it was Carol Ann said that I've uh, learned recently is transitioning into, a, into adulthood is not a one-time affair. <laughs> uh, for instance, we have this one student. He graduated from Damon College, which is the college we work most closely with, um, with a uh, Bachelor of Arts degree in English Literature. 4.0 grade point average, straight A's across the board, <coughs> an incredible writer, one of the most talented writers I've ever read. His professors thought, oh my goodness, this young man is really something extraordinary, and gave him all kinds of uh, kudos with his work. Of course, he didn't receive any of it. He says, oh, they're just making that up. They couldn't possibly think that about me. So really working on his confidence, um, which is another thing we really work on because a lot of them don't have a lot of self-confidence. But, so, but he went through college with us doing and did really, really well. He kept track of all his own coursework, wrote all his papers on time, read the books ahead of time, wrote papers, got them in, A's, A's, A's. And then he graduated with honors. And then we started talking to him about, well, it's time to go to work. And he had to be transitioned all over again because the executive functioning skills he was going to need to find a job and hold down a job were, were really different from what he needed to get through college. And his confidence, you know, it grew as he went through college and then he, he lost it all again because he didn't know how he was supposed to go about getting a job. And he didn't know what a job was going to expect of him. And he didn't know what to say or what to do to get it, you know, to do this transition to the work world. And that was such an incredible eye-opener for me that, um, as Carolyn said, this is not a one-time thing. Every time life kind of requires uh, someone on the spectrum to transition to a new aspect of life, they need to be taught how to transition. And they're not always going to have a CIP program around them when they have to make these transitions. And so one of the things we're trying to teach them is how to do this more independently, how to stop, observe, think about it, and then act. How what are the skills I need to transition, generally speaking, and then how do I apply these to this new situation I need to enter into? So, um, oh, just so you know, we also have a high school summer program that we do for two weeks during the summer, and it's called a sneak peek at college, and it's for young um teenagers on the spectrum, high end of the spectrum, as they um, begin to think about going to college, we bring them in for two weeks and kind of go through 
everything we offer in an abbreviated way and get them thinking about what it's going to take for them to be successful in college. Um, we help them start doing some person-centered planning. We teach them about executive functioning skills. We talk about being away from home for the first time um, and a whole gamut of things that they're going to need to think about uh, in order to get ready to go to college. So we do that at all six centers across the United States, and we do it in Amherst, New York, which, for those of you who don't know, is just north of the Walden Galleria. <laughs> Where the parking lots are filled with Ontario license plates every weekend. <laughs> we thank you, we thank you for our, your contributions to our economy. <laughs> I think they think I'm done. No, we got hours to go. Um, so, um, yeah, so our high school program is two weeks, and we just started this year a pilot program at our uh, Florida location called Beyond High School for students who graduated from high school or college and ended up on the couch. And so it's kind of... A, uh, a two-week time to get them up and moving again and thinking through what their next steps need to be in their lives and get them motivated and uh, skilled enough to take those steps for themselves. So, yeah, I still have time. Oh, I have two minutes remaining. I just wanted to really quickly look at um, what I wanted to, what I, not, what I was going to talk about tonight. Um, Something that we've become very uh, aware of this year at CIP Amherst is teaching our students routines as a way to help them develop good executive functioning skills. And I obviously don't have time to go through it tonight with you, but I would recommend to you uh, this book. If you are working with someone who has difficulties in the world of executive functioning skills, uh, this book is, and really it's only the first few chapters that you'll need to read, um, it's called The Power of Habit. The Power of Habit, and it's by Charles Duhigg, D as in David, U-H-I-G-G. -G. And uh, it, it's excellent in, in using it to teach young people about the importance of developing <coughs> good habits and routines in their life that keep them productive instead of sitting on the couch or spending hours and hours and hours behind a computer screen playing video games and not moving their life forward. And, and how powerful routines and habits are in driving our behavior, all of us, and how important it is for them to develop good, positive, productive routines and habits in their lives. So um, I recommend that maybe you take a look at this book. Okay? All right. Thank you.